Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandal Mongers podcast. What a day, what a week. Yes, yes, a, a very shocking disclosure, which I suppose puts the events of the last few weeks in a very different perspective. Yes, of course. And I think um, we have to be honest, if, we, uh, if we'd if we known about uh, the cancer, we would probably not have talked to Valentine in the way we did a few weeks ago. Um, yes. And a lot of things wouldn't have been published uh, on set around the world to fill that kind of vacuum that was left. But anyway... Um, we're talking about the, the, the shocking announcement that the Prince of Wales has cancer when it's being treated. Yeah. Um, I mean, in some ways, you know, everyone in the press was speculating um, and uh, maybe Valentine just had a very good instinct or, or perhaps he knew more than he was able to say. But sure. um, for those who haven't heard it, I mean, Valentine was actually very good uh, and very calm. And, uh, you know, he's particularly well informed being the former royal correspondent from The Times. But um, it does make me feel a little bit regretful, I guess, now, knowing what I now know. Um, and I'm probably not the only person who feels that way in our world. Of well, I think everyone in, in the media, you know, we were, we were, it was a big story. Uh, it was a story we felt we had to address. Uh, a lot of people had asked us about it. And we brought in a serious commentator. And I think, you know, we were raising some of the things that had been raised with us and elsewhere in the media for him to shoot down or to respond to, and, and which he did. So, you know, though, as you say, in retrospect, perhaps we would never have done that programme if the situation had been different. We we are where we are. Sure. I just wish the, the royal family had perhaps tried to 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 kill this story much earlier than they, they, they did very effectively uh, with her announcement. One thing it shows is the incredible global impact still of everything that they do. I mean... <clears throat> There are people all over the world reacting to this, and I'm completely obsessed with the story now. You know, we did well, she was a week. major, major figure. If you think, you know, we we do a lot of pieces on the monarchy. There are, you know, two crucial figures. I think in in the in the fa- I would call the Fab Four, which is the King and Queen and the uh, Prince and Princess of Wales, and two of them are out of action at the moment. It's putting a lot of pressure on the other two, who, after all, are t- having to be concerned about um, ill partners. Mm. Uh, and in some ways, it's spreading the load, hopefully, to to others like the Duke of Duck, Duchess of Edinburgh and, and the Princess Royal. Uh, but it's raised the, again the questions of whether we we do want to slim down monarchy. I don't know if you've got views. I mean, my own view is that we expect too much of them, uh, and we just you know there are only a certain number to go around. I think that we should have more of them, but I think we should be less demanding of them. Well, we've got used to it. I mean, every organisation above a certain number of members seems to feel it has to have a royal patron. And that they need that for visibility and to attract attention and money to throw yeah. events and parties. Um, that that would change a lot if if suddenly there were just three or four people and that's it. That would uh, it would transform the charity sector certainly in Britain. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, but I mean, is it? I mean, people complain, you know, that they're being knighted by Princess Anne rather than by the king. I mean, there is a sort of pecking order. Um, but I suppose even the minor royals still are better than nothing. But maybe, you know, this is too much to place in a particular family. I mean, the younger generation have their careers, they have their families. Um, you know, why should they all go into the family firm? I mean, it's a story, it's, it's you know, you could say it's a story of succession or any family firm. Yes. Which don't yes. tend to last generations. They tend also, to last there's, three there's, generations. There's been quite a high wastage rate in terms of both internal disputes, like with Harry and Meghan and, and them leaving. And then, of course, Andrew. Uh, you've, you've, uh, this Andrew's got a really good piece which is due to run in the Daily Mail uh, about his continuing work on Prince Andrew which I, I'd recommend to you if you're listening or watching um, and shall we move, pe- on? <laughs> yeah. move on? yes we should move on and, and also I recommend uh, um, a Channel 5 documentary on the Windsor's and the Bahamas that went out last night Saturday uh, which um, are you in shed- it? Uh, yes I was a consultant uh, oh, and um, indeed my daughter was the researcher Oh, excellent! So uh, it was business. a family family business there, like 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 the monarchy. Family business of scandal mongering. So we've had some lovely emails. Our friend David Wilson <laughs> was wrote uh, from the pool in Malaysia, listening to the Suez program a few weeks ago, um, saying how much he enjoyed it. 
although reminding us that some the, talk about the wind of change in the empire, actually quite a few things had already moved before Suez uh, in places like Malaya and Kenya. There was quite a lot of change, uh, which I thought was an interesting point. A uh, very nice comment on the uh, very interesting comment I thought on our program about Agatha Christie from somebody who Escarpment twenty four. Don't know who this person is, but he enjoyed the show very much. Uh, it, it really is worth checking out. Actually, we love Laura Thompson, um, and she points out he points out that the Mousetrap, the famous play by Agatha Christie, was based on the true story of his own uncle and his brother, who had been abused by the couple who fostered them. And then one of them had died as a result. As we did talk about, oh, sorry, about that story. how our stories were yeah. very dark. Well, that's one of them. That's the background. Yeah, gosh. Um, and our actually, numbers we, are good, Andrew. We, and we're popping up in all kinds of unusual places again on the chart good. Greece, Kuwait, Finland. Um, so people are finding us still. And, um, oh, good. And they're going back to old, old uh, podcasts, really, rather than just the new ones. Yes, no, they are. No, we had like, I think it was like 13,000 again this week. And only about two of those would have been, three of those maybe would have been for the new shows. No, oh, that's so good. Thank you for all the people that are exploring the back catalogue. Yes, thank you. Yes. No, we really need to build our subscribers. We're still sort of debating whether to do two programmes a week, which is quite demanding given we both are writing books at the moment and, and I have a full time job. Um, and whether people are happy just with here of notes and nonsense. And right. Well, you yes, you've got you've got your deadline. At least I haven't got a deadline in the same way. But we're wondering if if once a week is is better um, that you or, or if you really can't do without us. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we'll can. Every three days. Yes. Well, we've got a few more for the next couple of weeks, and then we might take a view about going back to one a week. Um, but today it's a special treat for you because once again you're talking. We're going to be talking to one of your heroes. Indeed, yes. Uh, Richard Norton Taylor is a is a long standing uh, champion of freedom of information. He's had a long career as the Whitehall correspondent of the Guardian, having worked for Newsweek and various other papers before that. I think it's a career going back over fifty years, uh, and he's been a doughty fighter for a whole series of of questions, not just about official secrecy, but um, uh, uh, anything really to deal with with secrecy in government. Uh, and I think we're going to cover a couple of the stories. I think we're, we're perhaps going to keep Lockerbie back because he did a lot of work on that for a future program. But otherwise, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think he's going to talk you... to us about the Iraq War. Yeah, about Julian exactly. Assange. Yeah, and um, the, the 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 rights and wrongs of that case. Yeah. And of course, um, Grenfell Tower. Which yes, he's, he's been uh, it was a terrible tragedy in Britain of a few years ago, which he's uh, done a lot of work on. And and very interesting because he's also a playwright and he's used his plays to to get public interest uh, and indeed uh, official interest in some of the stories and that's quite an interesting angle. I think he's unique there. Excellent. So uh, uh, I'm very looking forward to it. Okay, well here we go. Some good public interest investigative journalism coming your way right now. Here we go. Well, I'm delighted today to have uh, somebody I have a great deal of respect for, the investigative journalist Richard Norton Taylor, um, who's been looking into Whitehall and intelligence services till, since uh, 1975, having previously served as uh, a correspondent in Brussels. Um, Richard, just to begin, I mean, what are the most important campaigns do you think that you fought over the years? Well, I think um, the campaign against uniquely British official secrecy, I think, probably. And I benefited a lot because I started journalism as a sort of green journalist in Brussels, <clears throat> where Britain was about to join what we then call the common market or European community, uh, a better word than European Union, I think. Anyhow, and I saw Britain uh, as a, as a, as a, not at the centre of the universe, like so many British journalists do and still do indeed, Westminster is at the centre of the universe, but Britain... As, as an equal member of then a nine-member community, now uh, well over 20. but um, and, and so the kind of exceptionalism, if you like, of the British, the, the, the particular brand of official secrecy uh, did not work. And it was a wonderful playground for me as a journalist, a playground at least in a responsible way, uh, a, a wonderful place to be a, re a receptacle because other countries who before had sort of uh, resented British secrecy and uh, 
well, arrogance, like the Irish joined or the Danish small countries, but also the Germans and French uh, used to use us and uh, uh, journalists, British journalists, uh, to embarrass the British, really, um, because there are permanent negotiations about everything. Anyway, um, it also Brussels was, of course, a, a wonderful uh, centre for spies, where because it's the, it's, it was a, when when NATO uh, is, is headquarters, the headquarters of NATO is Brussels, was the headquarters of the European. Union. So it was a wonderful listening post and uh, for journalists like me. And uh, to, to, to repeat the point, when I came back to Britain, I took a sort of more, I could take a more distant, skeptical view of what the British were saying, what the British establishment was saying. And of course, the most secretive part of what Christopher Andrew, once the, uh, well, the official historian of MI5, described as the last taboo of British politics, i.e. the spooks, the secret and intelligence services. So that is what encouraged me uh, to um, pursue, when I came back to Britain from Brussels, the uh, antics activities of the security intelligence services and uh, defence too, of course, in particular, although official secrecy in general. And did it get easier or harder as you went on, do you think? Did my work get harder? Um, well, it, in in some ways... Yes, in some ways, no. Sorry about that boring answer. But because it, it, in some ways, yes, because as uh, Britain got more and more secret, certainly under conservative governments, but um, also easier because I was I got more and more confident, really. And the, the, the one got to learn the sort of undergrowth of Whitehall, the permanent government, as some people call it, um, or I call it actually, <laughs> and. Uh, that means the scene, the mandarins, if you like, of Whitehall, um, and uh, they under un, un, undergrowth of Whitehall. There were a lot of people who are frustrated by uh, um, politi their political masters, and uh, and indeed, in some ways, of secrecy and their cover-ups, the political cover-ups. I'm not saying that the Whitehall mandarin classes were in favour of uh, of greater openness, particularly, but they did. Um, get frustrated by lots of decisions. And that came out particularly during the sort of Tony Blair's government, actually, and it's specifically the invasion of Iraq in 2003, where um, that's just an example where I relied on and, and got very good information, including from uh, uh, the MI6, the Foreign Intelligence Services, half of which were viciously against the, uh, the invasion, as was MI5 under the, I think, rather... Um, wonderful Eliza Manning and Buller, who was the head of MI5. But of course, they kept, they, they talked to me a lot, but they were always not for quoting, i.e., I had to say Western intelligence officials mm -hmm. or British officials say X, Y, and Z, which was difficult in a way, but um, um, because they weren't sort of open whistleblowers. But you could make your point. Anyway, that encouraged me because I knew that uh, in, in, in the undergrowth were a lot of frustrated officials who were. Uh, very, um, let's say, opposed to the, the 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 antics and the activities, and indeed sometimes the policies of their political masters, i.e., ministers. I wanted to talk to you about Iraq because it seemed to me you talk about the secret state, but that was a time when maybe the secret state was powerless or wasn't able to get its own way um, because the political pressure was, you know, notably drawing up those famous dossiers and the supposedly sexed up language that was yes. used. Yes. Uh, it must have been an incredible time to be a journalist, actually. Uh, well, it, well, it, well, it, as well. Well, the, the growing frustration in uh, in, in various degrees, sometimes senior uh, mandarins and Whitehall, as I say, but also the uh, even inside the security intelligence services, who, for um, and and that's very rewarding, really. And and you get it was more than a game; it was serious, uh, professional, if you like, uh, for, uh, journalism. And um, sometimes you couldn't believe that. Uh, what people were telling him, and um, the, the only trouble was the impact was not as great as if you could name these people. I mean, just one person going back to invasion of Iraq is, is an example. Again, only one person, a, a lawyer in the Foreign Office, uh, resigned, and um, a woman who then um, on, became on the record. Yeah, she said things on the record, um, but it, it, it was because also you're encouraged to dig, if you like. I mean, and and as time went on, you felt sort of. Um, you, you felt uh, all, all the things that all the lies, if you like, or the uh, euphemisms and uh, degrees of uh, of uh, of, of uh, 
uh, uh, disingenuous, etc., that you you were you were uh, um, or half lies or unsaid lies and um, not direct lies, as they say in Whitehall. This wasn't a direct lie, Richard. When someone told me about uh, the sinking of the Belgrano during the Falklands War, but anyway, um, but uh, you did get um, more and more. You were getting encouraged because you knew that after experience that the frustration on various policies was building up if and, and if I can add even when the uh, the pressure increased partly thanks to what I'd written other people had written partly what the European Convention on Human Rights demanded i.e. putting MI5 and MI6 and GCHQ on a legal footing which they finally did under John Major uh, uh, Thatcher did under, under the phone tapping legislation actually and um Senior civil senior people in MI6 and MI5 said, "Yes, we want more openness, because otherwise you, I, me, and other journalists can make up all these stories about what we are up to, MI5 and MI6, and so on, and and they can't answer back because they don't officially exist." So officials says, "Minister to, to Thatcher and others, look, it's better at least that we put on a legal footing so we can say this is right, this is wrong. We can have some kind of outfit." Um, monitoring the uh, activities of the security intelligence service, i.e. the Parliamentary Inter uh, Intelligence Security Committee, which I have to say was a typical British thing. You you go one step or two steps forward and one and three quarter steps back, i.e. you have some kind of official committee independent of parliamentarians. But of course, you put so many loopholes around and restrictions on what they can do and what witnesses and what they can say and what witnesses they can hear. Um, but anyway, um, so it was ministers who are, who are sometimes more restrictive than uh, even officials who realize that they, 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 they needed to be a bit more open for pragmatic. Can I, can I have one more question on Iraq? Because I know Andrew's got lots of things he wants to talk about, but I, have a, I find this period fascinating. You had an amazing ringside view of it. And to you, I guess it was like a slow motion car crash. I hold my hand up. I, I was one of the many people who kept faith with Blair. You know, I, I let's face it, Saddam Hussein, he'd used weapons of mass destruction. He'd hidden them from the UN. There was every reason to believe he still had them, except there was no real evidence he still had them. And we were going to go to war over this. Yeah. Um, and of course, all the official, and this goes to your point about the secret state, once the disaster unfolded, there was inquiry after inquiry. And guess what? All the main players were acquitted. Well, yes, um, MI5, they didn't speak loud, loudly on, on the record at all. But, for example, the security service MI5 was concerned because it would encourage Islamist-based terrorism in Britain. It's a provocative act. You invade Iraq. Um, and MI, uh, military, uh, Foreign Intelligence Service, MI6, didn't like it because they were politicizing intelligence reports, i.e., the, the the dodgy dossiers and so on, and that above all was the the, the, the hand behind that of Alistair Campbell, Blair's uh, top spin doctor. But other people, and I've said this and written this before, should have done much more, like the Joint Intelligence Committee then under John Scarlett, who had been a good uh, spy master in Moscow and so on beforehand, but he went along far too much with the uh, the um, the uh, interference of of of, of uh, intelligence gathering, supposed to be rigorously independent mm, uh, mm. by uh, Tony Blair's number 10, yeah. It's interesting. I think Scarlett could have probably stopped it, but he didn't. Um, and he was he's, he's, Blair's uh, get-out-of-jail card in all those inquiries. Yeah. But, but isn't part of the problem that, I mean, the intelligence services like the, the armed forces were sort of politicised? You know, in order to get preferment, you basically had to be a yes-man, or you were, and, and the people who were promoted basically supported their political masters. So we had no independent sort of scrutiny or people speaking truth to power. That, that's right. That's right. Um, and uh, some did a little bit. Of, they, I mean, for example, I think MI6 was divided in half and some people would tell me things. And and uh, one example was uh, I wrote a story saying that, uh, uh, on your point, Andrew, that uh, the British and foreign intelligence of MI6 were, were not um, criticizing the CIA. And the CIA was just even more accepting whatever Bush and his uh, uh, other people were saying, even though people in the CIA knew that um, things were, things weren't uh, what they suggested uh, was happening in Iraq and Saddam Hussein's uh, weapons of mass destruction um, program and all that stuff. And so I wrote a story saying, um, MI6 officials have told me, the Guardian, blah, 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 that they're 
they're, they're very angry that the Foreign Office here um, is just accepting what America's CIA is saying all the time. And another point, really, is that when I, after the invasion of Iraq, and it, and it goes for more than just Iraq, it goes for I think everything, with someone very senior Whitehall official, very senior official involved in intelligence, and then and, and other senior roles told me, I won't say who he is, told me, Richard, he said, over lunch at the Travelers Club, the great the Spooks Club, if you like. Um, just think of it. No, just imagine any British Prime Minister to say no to an American president on such a vital issue as a military operation in Iraq. And it was a kind of, um, it, it was a, it was a the total as, it wasn't a, you know, a serious, he knew what the answer was. Um, and, and that was meant to persuade me. He was sympathetic with more openness, but he's just making the point that politically, because on the point, especially, you know, intelligence sharing is the key, the real, the real key to um, special relationship with America. But your point is that, 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 intelligence, that secrecy really comes from the top. So it's the, the politicians who are covering up that yes. actually the intelligence services might be more open. Or is it a, oh, a relative, wider problem? Relatively speaking, sorry, Andrew, relatively speaking, yes. But is it a wider problem? Is there a culture of secrecy, for example, in Whitehall? Is there too much to defer, uh, deference by the press, by uh, yes. even the courts, to, yes. to allow them to, to, in a sense, use national security to cover up things? Yes, I mean, you say even courts. Actually, courts are um, um, much more have been revealed in some court case taken by uh, know, brave lawyers, but um, on, on, for example, um, how, how British uh, uh, citizens and um, residents were, were taken to Guantanamo Bay by the Americans, uh, and these people took the matter to court, and because the judges, the courts demanded openness, demanded disclosure of documents. So a lot came out from MI5 and MI6 in the government and alleged uh, well, collusion in, in alleged torture and all that stuff. Um, but it's the, um, I mean, everyone's got a quiet life. They, I don't want to overdo the openness of the mandarins versus, the, versus the, their political masters, ministers, but everyone's got a quiet, quiet life. And so, you know, mandarins would say, um, they, they they want to deny everything as possible. All the weapons they use, euphemism, delaying tactics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, ministers also want a quiet life. They don't have to answer questions from members members of parliament. And, and uh, of course, so, so many members, very few backbenchers would, would um, w want to pursue uh, the activities or questions about the activities of security intelligence services. And um, there's a kind of you know uh, they're, they're indoctrinated. There's a kind of British clubby atmosphere. They said, come on, old boy, don't ask too many questions. It's very embarrassing. National security. National security is used, of course. National security it covers uh, a, a, a mountain of a multitude of sins. Um, national security, you can't possibly talk about national security. And and when and, and the whole official secrecy, that's another point, the official secrecy point is um, honoured in the rule, is honoured in the breach uh, as much as the observance, because Ministers say to MPs, it's a well-known practice, as you know, that I can't, um, that the government, successive governments have never uh, revealed anything about intelligence matters. But of course, then they leak like mad. Let's take the special uh, forces, for example. SAS, special forces, SBS and the naval equivalent, the SBS are covered by more official secrecy, a war of official secrecy, even than MF5, MF6 and GCHQ, at least has some kind of parliamentary committee looking at them, albeit in private. Um, SAS, you must be absolutely signed about SAS. Dangerous, you know, people's lives at risk, blah, blah, blah. But what happens? Unofficially, of course, the Ministry of Defense leaks stories to their special uh, trusted journalists to say, what a wonderful victory this British Special Forces did that X, Y, and Z when operations go well. So there's a tremendous amount of humbug in all this. Interesting. But we have a situation at the moment with an inquiry into the SAS and their operations in Iraq. Yes. which suggests that the, they were, for example, uh, yes. shooting innocent people and, and covering it up. Yes. I mean, well, that that is interesting because it, again, it's, it's a few couple of few journalists pushing this very hard. Um, I, I remember writing about it um, for, for a very long time, but uh, BBC Panorama and the Sunday Times did more, more recently, more digging on this, and uh, there comes a point. God knows how much argument. I'd love it to be a fly on the wall in the arguments in Whitehall saying, how do we stop this? Do we have an inquiry or not? And, of course, they have had an inquiry, and it's going on now. 
um, and uh, uh, and and it's and I think under quite a tough um, high appeal court judge. Uh, uh, well, and we're getting a former government minister, Johnny Mercer, admitting that John, he, he was well, aware that this was going on and yeah. really didn't really do anything at the time about it. Well, Johnny, it's quite interesting. Johnny Mercer um, said, uh, backed up the reports, you know, about uh, what wrongdoing, what um, ex executions, if you like, and, and uh, anyway, extrajudicial killing the SAS were alleged to have done. Indeed, evidence that they did do. And Johnny Mercer, the veterans minister now, gave evidence. But uh, in his statement, I mean, have a bad lawyer. He must have had a very bad lawyer, right? Because in his in his court statement or inquiry statement, he said, um, "People have told me two or three, multi uh, multiple people, i.e., former Special Forces officers, mates of his, uh, told me that this was going on. These this wrongdoing, this this these uh, ro ro these wrongful activities, execution of innocent people, unarmed people, and so on, in um, Afghanistan." And so they hadn't came and said, look, um, you've got to tell us who these people are. Um, because you get that they will be protected. They, they, we need to name these people, your sources, and uh, they won't they'll be protected by immunity from prosecution because we want to get to the truth, says Haddon Cave, the uh, inquiry chairman. And it's threatening him with um, because Mercer, very embarrassed, I think, didn't um e expect that uh, the 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 um, inquiry chairman to, to to push to push him on this, um, but he just he's just said rather loosely. I mean, if I were his lawyer, you can't say things in, the, in a statement like that without being warned by his lawyer. Said, "Look, you're going to be asked about this." Anyway, he's now um, threatened with um, it could be threatened with in jail. Actually, I don't know what's going to happen in the end. Um, but so he, just for, pe for, for people who don't know, and not everybody does, we're talking about Johnny Mercer, a former. Minister in the British Defence Ministry, well, a current who, uh, veteran minister a veteran, for Defence Affairs, yeah, yeah, who knows clearly does know things about these allegations of war yeah, because he knows he he was attached to the SAS in uh, Afghanistan, yeah, that's right, and he's now he's refusing to speak, and it's possible he might actually end up going to prison. Yes. Just for people who don't know, that's right, because under the court, uh, under the the, the Inquiries Act, uh, the, the inquiry uh, uh, um, witnesses and potential witnesses. Have got to I swear on earth, got to tell the truth, whole truth, nothing but the truth, and all that stuff. You cannot be protected just because yeah, you think that's, that's going to be. That's a hell of a story. Talking of hell of a story, changing the subject slightly, I'd love to ask you, yeah. um, from your position in the Guardian. I mean, I've re I've read David Lee's book about uh, Assange and that era. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, we're talking about freedom of information, security state, Assange, mm. hacking, breaking the law. What are the limits of that? I mean, he fell out with The Guardian rather spectacularly, according to that book. You may disagree. But now, of course, he's about to be extradited to a very uncertain fate. And a yeah. lot of us are really torn about what to think of this. I'd love to know your perspective. Well, during that song, who I met a few times early on in there, not didn't do much digging on this as, as, as David Lee and others in The Guardian, but... Uh, and he was an awkward customer. You know, he was one of these... You know, is it deep, deeply autistic or whatever? I mean... Um, that's what some people say or allege. He's clearly a man with a mission, whatever you want to call it. He had his source, uh, which, which is a breach of American security. I mean, it wasn't that wasn't his fault. If, if uh, he got in touch with this um, Josie Manning, as, as uh, now transgender woman, um, uh, and uh, and, and uh, he. he leaked a tremendous amount of information about uh, American operation in Iraq and Afghanistan and other diplomatic uh, telegrams were leaked as well. Now, at the beginning, this was uh, okay. Then, then uh, in a sense, it's easy to defend because, for example, revealed how U.S. Uh, helicopter uh, pilots and, and, and uh, troops were killing, uh, attacking people who, who uh, without uh, journalists and other people, um, with, there was no evidence that these people were terrorists. I mean, you know... It, Let's talk about other more modern, current uh, um, dispute, violent kind of conflicts now. But anyhow, and so he was, you know, whistleblowing in the in the traditional, I'd say, best sense of the word. But then he got more and more information leaking more, according to some people, um, a, a, a Pentagon code. Now I haven't seen the Pentagon code, but that's alleged. And uh, I think maybe he, he, you know, he irritated or angered. He, but he created a question of principle uh, for the U.S. 
or elements of the US government. Now, a couple of things. One is that if you ask former US defense secretaries, Robert Gates and other people, what damage has these leaks done? Americans would say on and off the record, no, no evidence of, of, of serious damage. People know that people leak. People know that uh, um, all sides do nasty things in violent conflicts. They cover up and so on and so forth, you know, whether you're the West or the East or South or North. Or, so there's an element of, of, of that. But then uh, also in, in America, they changed tack because, well, um, Obama sort of, First, he gave Chelsea Manning uh, Assange's main source, uh, uh, pardoned him, uh, uh, now her, and um, but but um, especially um, Trump's security intelligence people, CIA people, um, increased the, uh, the, the, the the charges against him from leaking and damaging X, Y, and Z to uh, espionage. First journalist to be done for ESMA under the American Espionage Act. Very serious stuff. I mean, it could be a 125 years sentence, you know. Mm. It's one of those Americans. Hyperbolic uh, sentences, um, uh, you know. And you must, do you share my view that what, but, sorry. whatever Assange has done, that just feels really, really harsh? Well, it, well has, he, has he been, some people, I mean, that was sort of, you could argue, he's been in prison for many years, seven years, more. He was in the Ecuador embassy. Maybe he shouldn't have done that. He should have coughed about uh, his a, a alleged uh, sexual abuse in, in, in Sweden and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is years ago, too. He's been, I mean, he's in that terrible mental and physical state. Has he been punished enough? And, uh, and, and how the other thing is, is question, just one last, very last point, is, is, is the extradition treaty between America and the US and the UK, which is actually very... Unbalanced, as very well, unbalanced, including Davis, a Tory and backbencher, is very good on this. Whether it's businessmen done for uh, 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 charged with fraud and so on, or in this case, you're in Assange, yes. No, I agree. Yes, that was the point I was going to make. I mean, we can't extradite a woman who killed a, a former intelligence officer who killed a boy in a car accident, and yet here we are volunteering right, yes. to give people right. up, exactly. And, and uh, the British, the, the local MP there, Andrea. What's her name? Uh, South Northamptonshire. Um, anyway. She's chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. No, no, another woman, Andrea, who was a minister at one point in Trump. Anyway, she was very good at pushing this. The Foreign Office finally were very good at pushing this. So she was tried, or not tried so much as she admitted dangerous driving and, and, and manslaughter yes. or whatever the thing was. But can't, but, but uh, it's, it's sort of suspended sentence. Anyway, she's not coming to Britain. Um, that was a quite a, a good case, which uh, you know had to be pursued um, rigorously by um, the lawyers of the family of this young boy. Uh, I mean, young, again, uh, for people who don't know, because we, we we are getting very yes, inside. Yes, yes. Here, for people who don't know, it was an American intelligence officer based in Britain drove on the wrong side of the road. You know, it happens. Yeah, yeah. Knocked down and killed, a, a, and then fled the country. Killed a yeah, British schoolboy. Fled the country, refused to come back. We have no rights to grab her. She was, as it, she did, in, in in fact, in the yeah. end, take part in a virtual court process. But you know, when it compared to that to to the way it works the other way, in terms of British justice delivering people to the American system, and it's very one sided. I've always felt that. Well, on on that point, it's a question of you know Britain kowtowing to, if you like, to to, to Washington because again. She um, initially said, or the Americans claimed diplomatic immunity. Uh, she, she was the wife of, of, of Crowton, R.E.F. Crowton in South Northamptonshire, and is a CIA base. Who knows that? Because I and other journalists have written that and it hasn't been denied. Well, it hasn't been admitted either, but you know, <laughs> it's a big CIA base where they control drone um, uh, operations uh, in, in the Middle East and so on. Um, Richard Lust. Sorry to trouble. Last, last week we discussed Gareth Williams, and I wondered if you had a Gareth view Williams, on yes. that case. Well, I'm one of the few people, and I think the police have believed, uh, agree with me, or vice versa, um, uh, and that I think, given his background, that he it was a, it was a it was a, a prank, if you like, a gone wrong. He was a very agile person. Other, one or two other people say. That could be that, that that could be done. What he did was he locked himself in a bag. He was a very fit, 
slim person. And people now say, some people now say, including some um, priests and, 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 uh, and um, not quite forensic scientists, but people who know about these things, say what I've always said. He had a landlady in Cheltenham because he was a seconded from GCHQ to help MI6 in London uh, uh, work out their, their coding system and computer stuff. Um, MI6, believe it or not, foreign inter human intelligence, they go with that, not like rely on GCHQ. Everyone relies more and more on GCHQ. That's another question, actually, about talking about surveillance. More and more technical ability to monitor people's activities and so on. Anyway, here's Gareth Williams, who uh, was seconded to GCHQ, and he was missing for a whole week. Now, GC MI6 management, they're not very good at managing these very old-fashioned outfits, and they're getting a bit marginally better, and, you know, public schoolboy, all that stuff, from MI6, I mean, you know. Um, unaccountable, they operate abroad, so they don't have to come anywhere near the scrutiny like pop, pops do here, or even MI5 dealing with Operation Security of Britain inside Britain. So anyway, here's Gareth Williams, and he was found, finally, inside his bag. Now, I, as I said, just to repeat myself, I said it is it's a possibility. I've known other people. There's one kind of, uh, Andrew, Phil, you may know this person, um, James Rusbridger. Well, James he, Rusbridger is an author of mine, yes. He wrote <laughs> he wrote about spooks and terms of services and so on, and he he was a curious man, lived on his own, and, and he, well, he didn't commit suicide intentionally, but he was found dead having sort of try, trying a, 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 a sort of a hanging operation in his cottage in um, Cornwall. Another person, I remember, um, middle ago, I remember Jonathan Aiken's private second. Uh, the, the orange in the mouth story. Orange Stephen the Milligan, mouth. the MP. Stephen Milligan, that's it. Um, and uh, anyway, going back to Garth Williams, I think he, you know, it, it was possible. But the coroner didn't uh, and thought this unlawful, unlawful. But no evidence unlawful. But you know, they think about the CIA, the uh, KGB, and so on. But no evidence KGB was involved at all. What about a, f a fingerprint? There were no fingerprints, for example. No, exactly. There no, there no second persons, no alleged killers, no yep. third party evidence that went into his flat, uh, Gareth Williams's flat. Um, by the way, in this inquest, the coroner really put the boot into MI6 for saying, "Why don't you look after this person uh, better?" You know, under your care for this this guy in a sensitive job uh, for for a whole um, week. Uh, you didn't uh, inquire. You wouldn't ask his parents uh, where he was, and so on and so forth. And, and um, it and and the and the MI six MI six uh, well, chief of MI six then John Soares apologized profusely um, uh, uh, because of uh, uh, one of the failings of his. Um, of his um, staff responsible for the care, if you like, or the, you know, just the question of, you know, he would have been kidnapped by Russians or anything. Not a word, not a word of inquiry about one of their own key employers, employees, beg your pardon, um, for a week in such a sensitive job. Yeah. Can it's I gone? raise raise another sort of campaign that you had, which was the the death on on um, the uh, Mount of Kintar in 1994, of a whole, know, series, yes. a whole series of MI5 and RUC officers yes. in, a, in, a, in a helicopter crash. Yes. Um, and you looked at that because the MOG, first of all, tried to blame the pilot. They for did. The um, but you found, actually, there was another side to this. Well, two things. One, one is that um, the, the responsibility, if you like, this is sort of, high, uh, in a way, a, a secondary point, that... Um, so many senior MI5 and uh, military intelligence people were put on one helicopter. So if that's something wrong with the helicopter, for whatever reason, they're, they're, they're all gone. Um, wealth of experience, people, et cetera, et cetera. But more importantly, the, these two pilots, well, the pilot and the co-pilot of Chinook, special forces pilot, they were really experienced. And it came about that uh, this particular uh, a Chinook helicopter had been involved in certain um, technical misfunctions, kept quiet, cover up, for some time. Um, and, and other Chinooks, the same of the same vintage too, for that matter. 
and uh, th- th- there was a, a, a row about because uh, because the, the top RAF guys who were so embarrassed by the whole thing said, "Oh no, no, the, the pilots fault, pilots fault. It was misty. They shouldn't have gone straight into the hillside and Mull of Kintyre and Scotland from Northern Ireland. They were." Um, and um, no, I decided people, one or two people, the RAF people, were friends of the pilots, the families of the pilots. Um, kept on at me and I said this is good give me some more evidence so I wrote about these uh, questions increasing questions raised and um, the uh, had furious arguments with air marshals and so on <laughs> finally um, the it, it was um, Fox uh, what's his name the, the, the uh, defense Liam Fox Liam Fox sorry that's right who was obviously persuaded he had some conscience there or anyway but whatever sparked his Serious concern. He ordered an inquiry into this, and, and you know, some of us—I don't say me, but some of us who questioned the, the whole thing—were uh, vindicated, and certainly the pilots were. And uh, there's a big row in the MOD. The MOD is an astonishingly un—it uh, shamelessly never learns lessons. Let's talk about secrecy really again. Uniquely, it never learns lessons because they get together the military side, the civil side. Uh, and, the, and the political side all together, and uh, their their default position is secrecy, secrecy, secrecy. But in the end of the day, um, the, the secrecy gets uh, blown apart or cracks and cracks until it is blown apart uh, more and more. And this Chinook case was a very important case because it involved people's reputations, individual families, two experienced pilots who were killed, as well as the other people, of course. On this flight, deep embarrassment by the um, intelligence establishment, inside intelligence establishment, and the RAF. I mean, the vicious correspondence I had with senior <laughs> RAF um, um, air marshals and so on, so so and so and so and so on. So, well, of course, the, most of the papers would say, "How can this uh, this Norton Taylor person, the Guardian, sort of raising questions and sort of um, it, it going down a sort of rabbit hole?" And, you know. um, but yeah, anyway, yeah. Talking of Northern Ireland, I mean, you've done a lot in Northern Ireland, and you've been writing recently about uh, uh, an agent called Steak Knife. Uh, yeah. And Steak Knife was a, an informer who was working for the British, but who was also allowed to carry on various atrocities. And I think you've argued that actually, on the balance, I mean, clearly informers need to be protected. Uh, you, you, they can't be allowed to, they have to keep on doing the, the bad things they do. But I think you, you, you're now showing that that actually... On, on the whole equation, he did more bad things than good, really. Well, he's not just me saying it. It's now that kind of the report came out, um, or the interim report by the um, a, a, a former chief constable and a, a, a British chief constable said that they actually uh, um, uh, there were more deaths and saving lives as a result of this guy's steak knife activity. Now, steak knife was a key... Well, it's a question of in Northern Ireland in particular, but it happens elsewhere too. That the, 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 the security intelligence agencies were given a free hand. State knife was a um, agent of the British Army, and of course they uh, they, they they took uh, MI5 also. The security service knew about him, uh, and the cops too. The cops, of course, bow, cow, uh, you know, defer to of course uh, MI5 and, 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 and Army intelligence there. Anyway, and this guy's steak knife was um, uh, was was a, 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 a astonishing, really, informer because he uh, was trusted by the uh, IRA because he was a member of that what they called the Nutting Squad. I mean, he was one of the IRA's own internal uh, investigative machinery, looking out for touts, as it were, informers. Um, but he was giving information to the British Army. The British Army allowed him to continue in his role because that's, that's where his value was, even if it meant, to, to the British Army's knowledge, killing a lot of RA alleged touts, alleged informers, which was a very, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, if you like, this is my word, the sickest, but it's the most vicious and um, amoral, if you like, and the morality don't really come into this, sort of, these kind of operations. And, um, and it's been going on for a long time. Books have been written about steak knife. The British um, Army still do not confirm that steak knife was indeed this guy, Scapaducci. Um, that's, his, that's his family name, which uh, he's now dead. Um, 
and and so they're still covering up you know, the British really um, elements of the British intelligence community. That is to say, the British Army in particular. And um, because if you let you know, if you if you if you say cough, they, they admit something there. It's the old thing about, as you know, Andrew. It's the neither confirm nor deny. Even when the evidence piles up, neither confirm nor, nor deny. N C N D because that opens cans of worms, cans of worms. Um, and uh, anyway, this uh, steak knife uh, incident or this character, uh, the, the uh, controversy continues, and, and it will do until the full uh, final report comes about his activities. Um, the, the Northern Ireland case, you know, rather like uh, the lines on that, you know, people have no accountability and they think they'll get away with it. Um, and, and it was complete, it was really quite chaotic in Northern Ireland because you had conflicting intelligence agencies on the British side. You had the police, so the MI5, the MI5 took over um, security uh, command, really, of the whole of Northern Ireland, being part of the UK. MI6 earlier on, MI6 were quite, sometimes MI6 look ahead. They say, what's going to happen after this, uh, the troubles, if you like, in this case, or after the violence, or after this conflict? And, and MI6 earlier on, the guy called um, uh, Oakley uh, talked secretly behind the scenes without ministerial knowledge, or not in a wink by some ministers, to talk uh, in the sort of back channels, as they're called, early on with um, um, McGuinness and um, Adams from the IRA years before um, the Good Friday uh, agreement. But MI6, the rivalry between MI6, MI5, um, and the military, three intelligence agencies, like, and then the police just sort of deferring because they were the junior a a agency in all these operations. Um, yeah. I mean, change your subject slightly. I mean, you're not just a journalist, you're a playwright. And the two, in some ways, are very connected because your plays are very much based on some of the campaigns that you've investigated. I mean, do, do you feel that plays, in some ways, can be more effective in bringing subjects to public notice? And we've seen that with the post office scandal recently. Yeah, I, so. do, actually. I do. I think um, the theatre, well, the post office scandal, of course, it was television. But uh, I, in the past, have, have done. Um, edited public inquiries mainly it's not me creating or, or it's not my original work it, it's editing but the theater was a great um another platform for, for journalists if you like investigative journalists because often when you're writing for the newspaper in a running story you can't get a story uh, in the newspaper or, or on television or, or, or radio every single day let's take bloody sunday for example it went on for 10 years um, ten years evidence, bloody Sunday. I put in a play of less than three hours, and it, it, there's an appetite. The point is, an appetite for information. You can't expect people to follow these long cases. But, um, the Color of Justice was a big story, uh, inquiry too about the the, 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 the the racist murder of Stephen Lawrence, the, the black teenager in, in South London, um, many years ago now. Um, that lasts a long time. And, and But if you put these things in a two and a half, three hours piece, explaining what happened, this is it. The devil's often the detail. People are speaking themselves. I, none of these are my words. I mean, I you know distill them and so on. And an audience with people reacting, a live audience, is actually quite effective and powerful, striking chords, I think, than... You know, when you're writing, just talking as a journalist now, when you're writing about all this stuff, you never know how many people are reacting or sputtering over their cornflakes or just turning over the page because they're not interested in this thing, um, especially if they're running. And nor are, your, nor are your editors, actually. They say, oh, my God, which is not another story on Bloody Sunday. You know, so you get all this out on in, in, a, in a specific piece, uh, you know, not on a text, two, or three, two, two and a half hours, three hours, uh, in in the theatres or, or sometimes the television, I did Nuremberg too, actually, um, which you know lasted many many years too, um, in in about three hours. And people like you know there you had Goering, what did Goering say? What did Spear say? And uh, various things. I did one of the of Iraq on and 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 it's a very rewarding thing, I think for journalists anyway. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, but you did bring change because Michael Gove, who was a government minister, went to your play on Grenville. And perhaps did. you could tell the audience about the Grenville. Grenville, Andrew. Grenfell. Grenfell. 
Yes, uh, he did, because I think that did make some changes. Well, he this did. The, I'm sorry again. My role here to try to interpret yes, yes. Uh, this for people who don't know are not British. The Grenfell. I, I'm now. You've got me saying it wrong. <laughs> Grenfell Tower disaster, tragedy, horrible fire at a tower block. People trapped, people dying, people being advised to stay when they should have been told to leave. Over 70 and days. Terrible, terrible tragedy. And, of course, it turned out that the materials that had been used in this building were, yep. well, not, maybe not substandard, but the standards were very low, and people had known that there, were, there was very dangerous and fire. And, and people rapidly knew, knew enough people shouldn't have, and knew that there was infra inflammable material. Yep. Yeah, and it was in a place that tended to be lived in by poorer people, and exactly. maybe that was a factor, and it almost certainly was. Uh, yeah. and how it was managed. But well, Michael Gove, who came to uh, Grenville Play, and he, I mean, to give him his due, I'm allowed to say this, I mean, without sounding um, too sympathetic with any politician, I know, but, um, he came and listened, and he was genuinely shocked by the um, irresponsibility, if you like, and the cover-ups by the constructing companies and the, and the people who provided the material for the um, knowingly dangerous material uh, for this um, tower block um, reconstruction, if you like. And um, he was genuinely shocked. And, and I think that encouraged him to, I mean, he hasn't succeeded yet entirely because it affected this material was used in many other uh, tower blocks and uh, affecting uh, leaseholders now. The leaseholders can't sell their properties and uh, all that. And have people got compensation? I mean, has have have the rules changed about cladding, for example? Well, they try to change the rules, and then there's an offer of compensation, but there's they, they haven't got them yet. It's like conversation on lots of other things. You, you mentioned the post office scandal before, but but uh, going back to go, Gove did actually take it on board, I think, and I because by listening, he he didn't. Civil servants don't give him the evidence and stuff because partly the evidence shows that Whitehall civil servants were lazy. Uh, yes. Pass the buck. Passing the buck is another wonderful thing in uh, in 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 Whitehall. You know, but it's great that you could condense it all into a single emotional experience. Well, I think and, so. You know, well, get the attention of people that mattered. Yeah. That way. Years of being a journalist, and um, you get this word. It's the craft of trade. I what is journalism? You know, that's what people question. Um, but you get the craft of distilling things. You edit yourself. When you're listening, when you're in a courtroom or whatever it is, you're writing down in your notebook lots of material, many words. You've got to, when you're writing a story, you've got to actually um, say uh, to yourself, you know, condense it into 900 words. 900 words, 800 words, 500 words, that's not very much. And sometimes you're lucky you get a sort of um, a, a feature, you get a whole page, a thousand words, 1,200 words. But, you know, these plays, uh, no, eight, no. Eight, many more thousands of words. Anybody, but, anybody who's written a book, and I think all three of us have, exactly. will tell you that the problem isn't writing, the problem is editing. Yeah, well, well in a way, yeah, absolutely. But that's why it's so relieving. I mean, Andrew, in fact, you, you would know that um, writing a book is, is more satisfying sometimes. It's a hell of a sweat, of course, but uh, that, that, that's my answer. The, the playwriting was... was, was was also rewarding, and people commented, and people came. People don't go to the theatre came. Um, anyway, yeah. And looking back over 50 years, what, what have been the most rewarding moments of the things that you did? And, and do you feel things are changing? Well, I, I think mean, things, yeah. there's less accountability or more? Well, I think rewarding in the sense of, uh, uh, you know, not, not so much that you've been proved right on so many things, like, let's say, going back to your uh, invasion of Iraq, uh, secrecy in the MOD and your prove right whether it's even um, weapon systems that don't work still don't work waste of money on that with the Chinook case we talked about um, and, the, and the Chinook crash and the causes of that crash in the Mall of Kantar um, the, the general awareness that, uh, that they should open up this most secretive part of government or state activity done in our name if you paid by taxpayers i.e. the activities of the security intelligence agencies I think the uh, links with the uh, CIA on uh, t t sending people to Guantanamo Bay, British citizens or British residents, denied um, uh, for years and years by um, by, by ministers, and uh, so so it's basically opening up things. And, and people and, and eventually they say, look, we cannot keep this quiet because there'll be certain journalists who will pursue this, who will be. Uh, 
persistent and uh, uh, maybe not m many of us, but quite a few of us. But but this is on. Um, I just want to say something about the general point about surveillance and, and the. Shall I say? Can I say something about that? Or of course you can. Yes, absolutely. Just between do between Britain and uh, the British uh, intelligence security companies uh, agencies. Sorry, and um, and um, and and the public and the police, for that matter. And that is that there are more and more the growth of of uh, intrusive technology, like surveillance technology, computer technology. Is uh, is so great that and the intelligence security agencies cannot resist amassing all this because they can amass it as Edward Snowden, this former um, uh, American National Security Agency contractor, revealed not uh, a few years ago. And and when GCHQ, for example, had all these enormous computers doing some good work, we want to know if Britain is under threat, you know, and uh, especially under it's not a cyber attack by the Russians or whoever. But they've got to see. Uh, uh, what, what is relevance? They can't be flooded by all this material, and and they say, you know, oh, it's difficult to find all these real threats to terrorists, you know, the, the and the, difficult to find the, and the needles and uh, in the haystacks. Well, I say they're building more and more haystacks by amassing more and more material, which they cannot possibly um, have the uh, serious, effective. Uh, investigating the significance of this material. Most of the serious terrorist attacks in Britain, quite a few in the 2017 Manchester Arena, Westminster Bridge, uh, London Borough Market, 7-7 um, seven, seven London bombings, um, they were, the, the people, the suicide bombers, the bombers, the perpetrators were known to MI5 um, and the intelligence services. Now, the, the MI5 can't do anything, but you've you got to, you've got to, have basic old-fashioned resources, old-fashioned police work, if you like, on the ground, not relying on the easy reliance on um, uh, on, on, on uh, red red signals coming out, uh, danger signs coming out on your computers. You know that doesn't work anymore. Anyway, that's my that's one of my big points about. The no, I agree. Um, the well, the wood for the trees. We should really. look. We should look into that, Andrew. Um, I think before before we let you go, Richard, I thought you'd like to know that. Um, you have a review for your book, The State of Secrecy. <laughs> a young man called Andrew Loney was quite impressed. He knows it. I'm sure he knows well. He's quite impressed. <laughs> and he says, and I think he's absolutely right to say, we are very lucky as a nation to have independent journalists like Norton Taylor who are prepared to speak truth to power. And I recommend the book, Universal. That's very, very kind, Andrew. Well, Andrew, if I may say so, um, is a very, very, well, it started off, I knew him when he was more of a kind of literary agent than actually a writer. An author of very good books, including that one, well, all sorts of ones, which I may rip. And uh, and and uh, anyway, the, uh, well, 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 you're a great, you're a great inspiration to me. And I mean, if, I wish there were more journalists like you yeah, doing what you do. But it's, it's quite interesting because I mean, I'm getting old. I'm getting on for eighty now, and but actually, it keeps your brain going because if you still got, if your health is okay, and and you've got the kind of urge to pursue. And attack secrecy when you to, to reveal things. Now, reveal things is maybe too pompous a word, but to investigate, that's what I call the powers of the forces of darkness. I mean, the forces of darkness, not even in Britain, a democracy, but they are there. And Andrew, you well know. And um, you know, and, and official secrecy and the troubles you've had, I've had about breaking down and the expense actually too. In your case, uh, uh, breaking down official secrecy, which which I don't think is frustrating because it actually. At the end of the day, things are going to open up. It may take a very, very long time. That's the frustrating thing. But it's putting on the if you like, the forces of darkness, those people who are so secretive, on the defensive and, and making them worried. Uh, and, uh, and, well, and, uh, I think and both our argument is lovely. that the, the secrets they protect are often very innocent. And that means that it just leaves a, a vacuum for speculation. It's, we see it with royal yeah. coverage as well. Yeah. And it's better. I mean, we uh, would earn more trust if we could trust them to be secret about the really important things. But I like the idea that we need to re raise our blood pressure just to, as we get older, just to well, keep well, ourselves well, young. Keep, keep the brain going. I mean, the brain is a muscle. I, I keep on saying that. Even neuroscientists say they agree with that now. The brain well, is well, Long like may you exercise yours in the public interest, as you have so many times. And thank yeah, you so much. Thank you so much. We'd love to have you back. Experience with us. Other really, subjects. Really inspiring. Thanks thank a lot. You.
Well, a lot of ground covered there. Yeah, we're so lucky to get to talk to people like Richard. I mean, <laughs> um, and lots of other our old friends who do important work. It really is uh, yeah. it's a nice part of what we do, I think. Yes, and I think what they do is do it with great dignity and perseverance, but um, uh, it's not the sort of angry sort of agitation that you get from some some writers. I mean, I think he does get across, as I do, about some of the terrible things that go on. But I think, you know, because he... He appears always so level-headed, uh, and um, well, I think uh, he enjoys it. <laughs> it's a game, yeah. isn't it? Uh, a game of kind of tracking people down and up, bursting pompous balloons and things like that. I wonder if it all goes back to our, our childhood and being, you know, some of the natural rebels or, or anti-authoritarian, and others are a natural sort of head prefects. Yes, I think that's where would you be? I'd probably be more the prefect end of the scale when I was a kid, I have to say. Uh, I suspect you were, even though your famously posh background, I, I reckon you were always a troublemaker, a member of the, <laughs> or, the awkward squad. I, I was a, just a quiet rebel, yes. Gosh, so you've uh, moved, you've got less, because, I mean, you moved from becoming a Republican to uh, supporting the monarchy. So in some well, ways, a little bit, yeah. I certainly, on, in terms of the monarchy, I probably have changed my position. But I spent a long time working on these campaigning shows like World in Action and Panorama, and you know played a small part in some some pretty exciting stories that did all the things that Richard just talked about. Um, exactly. Well, um, I think we should perhaps do a, a program on your TV career because there are a lot of a lot of awards, a lot of programs. Um, who knows? And a lot of things that you got changed, and I think people aren't aware of that. So maybe that's mm-hmm. what we should have coming up. Right. Well, when we run out of. Um, Guardian reporters to interview. We can start talking to ourselves again. But I thought that was well, really interesting. I really like Richard a lot. Yes, yes, yes. No, he's he's. You know, I hope we can get him back. Talk about Lockerbie and other things. No, let's do that. So, Actually, talk, talking of impressive people, uh, I should have mentioned at the beginning of the show we had loads of people just being so warm and positive about Jason Evans, who talked yes. to us last week, well, four days ago, about the uh, the blood infected blood scandal. Just so many lovely comments um, about his dignity. And, uh, you know, a few sentimental things too, which is um, Lynn Hubbard, who's an old friend of ours, simply said, if there's an afterlife, Jason's late father will be applauding him and so proud. And I thought that was rather moving. uh, It is nice. For those who don't know, Jason lost his dad, but he was very young, to this scandal and has spent uh, the better part of his life trying to get to the bottom of it and get some justice. And some changes. Yeah. Well, it's nice when, you know, the serious programs that we do like that do get, you know, a lot of feedback and, and traction because that's, I think, really what we like doing. Yes. Shining a light on some of these stories. We do. We do. All right. Well, talking of which, um, we are, we've got some more treats coming up. We're still sticking to two a week for a while. Uh, we've got a snooker, snooker film. Um, we're talking about Hess, uh, snooker film no longer in television, Phil, a snooker program. Uh, we're going to talk about Rudolf Hess. Hannah Barnes is joining us soon to talk about the Tavistock. Uh, and uh, we talked about European royalty, but I think you found a way to make a program just on the Spanish royal family. Is that right? I'm hoping so. I think King Juan has uh, has got quite a checkered history. And I'm, so I'm looking for a, a journalist uh, or a writer who can uh, t- talk knowledgeably about the subject uh, in English. Uh, so hopefully we'll get something there. I mean, there are clearly a lot of European royals we could be talking about. Uh, someone has suggested a number of subjects. So I think we may be looking at that. Um, so we're trying to mix the, the contemporary with the historical. We are. Uh, we also, I think... uh, we've, we found, um, I mentioned my wife who runs Putney Library a few times. She's a, a book that she loves about um, the great women of ancient Rome and their life stories. We're going to be doing a program on that. Um, oh, yes. Scandals of the ancient world. And some of them are pretty hair-raising. Yes, I'm looking forward to reading it that that book too. Um, so yeah, a very very program coming up, uh, and uh, we hope you hope we l- you like it. We certainly do. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you both soon. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandal Mongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 